Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Robert Keston, Executive Director of Stonewall National Museum Archive and Library, based in Fort Lauderdale, with one of the largest, if not the largest, lending library in the LGBTQ community, one of the largest archives, and a new museum that's not so new anymore uh, that utilizes the collections that we have in order to tell the story of LGBTQ history, culture, and the world around us and how integrated we all are and how integral we are to the history of America and the world. Uh, our people are everywhere, as you all know. There's not one community that's not represented by our community, regardless of religion, race, creed, color, size, shape, ability, or disability. Um, whatever it is, there's someone from that community in our community, which makes us very unique in the world because no other group can say that. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight to have Jonathan Ned Katz, who graciously donated about 900 books to our collection, which is monumental. It is now on display at our museum and anyone who wants to come in uh, can visit between 11 and 5 p.m. on weekdays and uh, between 11 and 3 p.m. on weekend days. The exhibit will be up through December, so we hope that you will find your way to Fort Lauderdale and walk through, see the books he collected, look at some of his notes, look at how he came upon the decisions that he made in discussing LGBTQ history, and in some respects, helping to create uh, how this vast world of information is studied. So we are entering our 50th year here at Stonewall. Uh, we have a lot of things going on and a lot of things planned. So please visit our website and uh, visit us, become a member, join us in any way you can, uh, help us tell your story as we are now going to tell a little bit of Jonathan's story. So. Thank you very much for joining us. And I just wanted to thank uh, Hunter Ohanian, my predecessor, for working on bringing that collection to Stonewall. And uh, thank you for the most generous contribution. It is really exciting uh, when I walk in every day and walk into the uh, library and to the museum and see all those books on shelves and in cases. And I'm reminded of some of the great authors, some of the extraordinary history, some of the interesting elements that contribute to what makes things different when actually they're not necessarily so different. So how did you, based on the way you grew up, um, your father's studies, uh, the, the neighborhood that you grew up in, how did you end up making this your life's work or a good part of your life's work? Well, my, my father was a great inspiration. He was very, very interested in Black American history, which was unusual for a white guy of his time. He um, inspired both me and my brother to become historians. My brother uh, did uh, pioneering work in Black American history and Native American history. And um, my, my work in history actually started in, uh, in, as some radio plays that I did for uh, the Pacifica station in New York in the late 1960s on Black American history. And um, one of them was about a fugitive slave resistance that took place in Pennsylvania, where a shootout when a, uh, a slave owner came to recapture his slaves in 1851. And they, the, the Black people in Pennsylvania had warned uh, the slave owner that he'd get killed if he persisted because they were not going to go back to slavery. And he did persist and he did get killed. And it became um, the newspapers headline this is... Uh, a civil war breaks out. This is 10 years before the Civil War. First 
uh, outbreak of civil war in the United States. So, um, so my interest in black resistance history uh, led me to be very interested in, after I got involved in the gay movement in 1971 and came out of the closet um, in my 30s, I uh, got very interested in resistance history as well as oppression history. I think those two kinds of history are very important for persecuted people to know about. Not only have things been really bad, but that in very many ways, we have resisted all that bad stuff. So in the winter of 1971, I got, I dared to walk through the uh, door in which the Gay Activist Alliance was meeting. I was terrified to walk through that door because I knew it would change my life. And I didn't know how exactly, but I needed, I knew I needed to do that, to walk through that door and join up this organization. And I did that. And it led to me, uh, my involvement in the GAA in New York led me to think, well, I could put together a, a documentary play. I could look for documents. There must be such a thing as gay history, as we called it then. Uh, I, 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 I can find some, I'll find some documents, put them together and put together a script for a documentary play. And I did that. It was called, the play is called uh, coming out, I, I happen to have uh, a published copy of it here. It was published as part of a Arno Press series, and it was mostly a, a, a documentary. But I did write some dramatic uh, speeches for for it to end with uh, at a um, a gay pride rally. So. Um, so that was really exciting. It was one of the highlights of my life to work on that play with the director and the women and the men in the cast and the uh, Black actor that was in the cast who asked me to write a speech for him because those women had special speeches for them. And I did that and he gave that speech at the end. And we had, there were lots of things that we worked out as we went along and rehearsed this play. And, it, and as I say, it became one of, I remember it just as a highlight of my life. And people came to this, see this play, they expected a really uh, didactic, proselytizing piece. And, and they, lots of the uh, people expressed in written responses to the play that, oh, we were really surprised. It was really moving. And it was made up of gay history documents. We had never seen such a thing before. So writing that play and having it produced by the Gay Activist Alliance in a firehouse in Soho in New York City um, led to a lot of publicity about the play it was written up in the New York Times in a nice review by Martin Duberman, the historian. And um, that publicity led to a publisher giving me a contract for a book that became Gay American History. I can hardly hold it up. It's so heavy. <laughs> I, when I would go around and talk and bring the book with me, I would say, you know, I said, I can't write such heavy books in the future. It's too heavy to carry them. But I wanted to show that there was plenty of material on lesbian and gay and bisexual and transgender history. So I stuffed everything I had found in the research and the early 1970s into this book because I didn't know whether there'd be another chance to get the word out about these remarkable, uh, interesting people that I had found. Um, 
So I did, you know, I didn't know whether there would be a development within academia of scholars uh, following up on um, doing research, empirical research, and trying to figure out what all this evidence means. I didn't know whether that would happen in academia in the mid-1970s. So, yeah. So I, um, Carla J, the wonderful Carla J, who has a great sense of humor, said I had a footnote fetish because I stuffed <laughs> the book is full of footnotes and you know citations to all these documents that I had found because I I wanted to let people know about this wonderful material and so I made sure I put it all into gay American history. But you and then you wrote subsequent books, and ultimately, the academia caught up and is now quite robust. But it yes. did take quite a bit of time for that to happen. So for a while there, you were out on your own, uh, really collecting the data and making it available so that other people could pick up on it. Uh, but it still was not accepted in mainstream society. Um, yeah, and as we know, with this election today, that in many places it's still not accepted by mainstream society. And yeah. yet, what would you say are the one or two things that cause that divisiveness that keeps us on the outside rather than being a part of what's going on in the world? Why? Do certain people believe that we are so different and so dangerous that we should be ostracized and scapegoated time and time again? Yeah, we're used by politicians to rile up the public who is susceptible to being riled up and made angry and have their anger about their lives and the failure of the American dream in many people's lives. They're told by Hollywood movies, say that, oh, everybody can access the dream, move ahead, get richer, have fabulous love life. Um, and Lots of stuff doesn't work out for lots of people. And the economy uh, for many jobs has, you know, gone to other countries. And um, so I, politicians are using people, they're conning people about, you know, they're to blame transgender people. It's so ridiculous to you know, and uh, that's become a big issue and on the right transgender. When you, when you started, and, and you mentioned it even here today, when you started writing, when you came out yourself, it was a gay world. It wasn't a lesbian world. It wasn't a bi world. It certainly wasn't a transgender world. And But since you study this, how did that evolution take place? How did it go from GLBT to LGBT, yeah. where, was that, where did that transition take place? Well, you can sort of study it, that transition in the titles to my books, Gay American History is the, the main title. And then the subtitle is Lesbians First and Gay Men in the USA. And then let's see, the next book is published in 1980. Five, so gay and lesbian is in the main title. Lesbian gets into the main title. It's a new documentary on the history of those persons now called lesbians and gay men and of the changing social forms and responses. I was trying to get at the fact that the things that sex between men and sex between women has been called, has changed and been 
conceptualized in completely different ways in different eras. And if we want to understand people of the past, say Walt Whitman or Gertrude Stein in the uh, early 20th century, um, we need to understand what terms and concepts were available to them to understand themselves. You know, there, there wasn't, there, uh, Walt Whitman didn't have the terms homosexual and heterosexual in his time. So how did people, how did he understand uh, loving, intimate, sensual relations, sexual relations between men? He began to name these intimate relationships different things, comrade love, uh, calamus love. He gave, he was naming in a new way, the in a positive way, these intimate relationships between men. That's one of the things this poetry does. So um, I'm very interested in trying to understand people in the past, which uh, in their own historical context. I think we honor them by really trying to get into th their heads to what kind of values they met up with in their world about sexuality, about, about sensuality. Um, so, do you, do you yeah. find that they ran into the same obstacles and the same prejudices? or because you couldn't name those things in in these ways, in those ways, um, at that time, was it something that was less divisive, less frightening, uh, less used by those in power to um, diminish a class of people? Yeah, I think it's really interesting to recall that in the early colonial American period, you could be executed if you were found guilty of sodomy, men in particular, and uh, and a few men were actually uh, executed under those colonial laws. So that's pretty different from, you know, it's bad when I grew up, but not that bad. Um, so what did, think about what that would mean to have the death penalty hanging over your head if you were, as you were having a good time having sex with a man and you were thinking, oh my God, if somebody finds out, I'm gonna be executed. Um, if we think we had a bad, um, think about that. Um, it's an extreme example. I like to use that example because, you know, it's really startling to think about how different uh, people have lived because social conditions were so different in their time. I have lived myself through different historical periods of gay history, homosexual history. Um, so I am very aware of how I was so ashamed of being gay and then coming out, it was such a huge change for the positive in my life when I joined up with others in the Gay Activist Alliance and the gay movement and came out and to my family, to my mother the morning the, my gay liberation play was to open, my mother called on the phone and said, is that you in the village voice? And she had seen a, a ad for my play called Coming Out with my name on it. I realized that even though it scared me, I couldn't write a gay liberation play without using my real name. So uh, that was my real coming out to my mother process by her seeing an ad for my play in the Village Voice. How many characters are in the play? There is about five women and five men. Uh, and it was uh, well directed by a man named David Rogensack, who I became good friends with. 
and um, and he was also a he worked as a professional theater publicist so he knew how to reach out to newspapers and had the telephone number for the people to call you could never do that nowadays it just the rules have become much more strict about the ethics of who knows who and what, who you know and um properly so but it's funny to me to think that he could just get us publicity for this uh, this outlandish gay liberation play in the new york times uh be harder to do nowadays when was the last time it was performed? Oh, probably 1973 in Boston. There was a Boston production of it as well as a New York production. So we, also, we also did it in New York in 1973. So it's the year it came out is the year that it came out and has not been produced again. No, it would date. It's a period piece. Uh, it might be interesting to do as a period piece. It, I, I have no idea what those speeches I write, I wrote then would sound like now. Um, yeah, it, I maybe you know some new play needs to be written. <laughs> I, even as a reading, it would be interesting just from the historic context of that that was progressive back then and it would probably seem as you said somewhat dated today yeah, but seem... the other thing that's interesting is you talked about the death sentence in colonial times and yet even in today's world if you're in Iran or if you're in parts of Africa or if you're in other parts of of Asia or the Middle East they do face that even today and even though on occasion people do speak out there's really not the outpouring of of protest that one might expect considering the own the pushback that we're getting even here in the United States at this time with don't say gay and um book banning and and the like the the correlations of what has happened and what is happening what might happen are interesting there have been American politicians that have called for the death penalty uh now in the 21st century so i'm i don't believe that it will happen but stranger things have happened when politicians start screaming and yelling and building their power base on those kinds of hateful things yes i i'm very worried about the rise of hate speech and uh, my last book the most recently published was is called the daring life and dangerous times of eve adams and it's about a jewish polish emigrate to the u.s in 1912 uh who was her Polish name, and um, she comes to the U.S. and gets involved with the notorious anarchists Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, and therefore, and she starts selling radical periodicals and making a living that way and touring around the country, and therefore she gets on the FBI, so it's a forerunner of the, of the, the Bureau of Investigation. It, she gets on the forerunner of the FBI and she gets on their surveillance radar. And they uh, start to uh, question her and stop her from on her selling radical periodicals. You know, we're supposed to have a freedom of the press in the United States and freedom of speech. But that's her radical activities that the young J. Edgar Hoover was uh, getting these agents to uh, go after this young woman. So, so finally, there's a conspiracy against her and the federal officials and local officials um, the police send in a woman 
to a policewoman to entrap Eve, and she's arrested. She's tried for uh, publishing an obscene book because in 1925, Eve, uh, under the name, uh, well, she used the name Eve Adams, and uh, she wrote a book called Lesbian Love under a pseudonym Evelyn Adams. And it's the, in 1925, she published this book. And it's the, amazing because there's nothing like it uh, almost in her own time. It was really, really pioneering. I call it a community study. Um, and I republished Eve book, uh, which is really hard to get in the uh, uh, end of my biography of Eve. And so Eve is, she's really, the US government is out to get her and she never had become a citizen. So they're able to, she has less rights than a citizen would have. So they, they managed to jail her for a year and a half because of obscenity and so-called supposedly coming on to this police woman sent to entrap her. They put her in jail. They then deport her. And then she lives in France for 10 years. And then in 1940, the Nazis invade France. And Eve and her beloved woman companion, Hella Olstein, hide out from the Nazis as long as they can. But in 1943, they're both arrested and taken to Auschwitz and murdered. So Eve becomes a victim, a Holocaust victim, but her, she's not only a victim. So she's a very, she's an early lesbian activist, an early sexual resistor. And uh, she's the nasty things that are said about her. She dresses mannishly. She has short hair. She, she doesn't look feminine enough. That's what the FBI agents say about her. Things like that. The prejudice is really overt. So I stress that, you know, her life is, is really uh, relevant to today's scary politics where there's so much hate speech is encouraged and so much hateful action is encouraged. And we see the rise of anti-Semitism and the rise of police actions against black people and leftists and union organizers and uh, all kinds of uh, activities like that. As I was working on the book uh, about Eve and who lived in the rise, rise during the rise of fascism, uh, I could not help being scared by the similar rise of hateful uh, anti-democratic actions in the US, in the US and a uh, ex-president who claimed he won an election where there's no evidence at all for it. It's so, as to me, as a historian, what I do is evaluate evidence. I look for documents, and then I try to figure out what they mean, what's the context, how to interpret them. And so evidence is really important to me. So people just asserting things on the internet, and people are conned into believing them. It's, it's shocking to me that people just believe something because it's on the internet with no evidence. Well, how, how much as a historian, as someone who bases the work that you do in fact, uh, how much responsibility do you think the media has for all of this creation of, of hate, animosity, and, and for lack of a better term, fake news? Well, the media and the internet, in particular newspapers, I mean, there are technologies. So all technology can be used for good things and bad things. In some ways, this new internet, it's not that new anymore. It's new for me as a person born in the mid, in the late 1930s. Um, so 
the, you know, it, technology can be used for good things and bad things, and it's being used for both. And I very much appreciate it that papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post are saying when there's no evidence for a, uh, a president being elected, uh, that there's no evidence for your claims. When you make a fact claim, you need evidence to back it up. And there's often no evidence for stuff that goes on that politicians are saying. They're conning people because they're talking without, they're just asserting things and expecting people and unfortunately uh, to, to, um, to believe them without evidence. It's, but do you find uh, that they also pay attention or too much attention to specific things? that call attention to it in the public, um, where if they let it go, it wouldn't get the kind of visibility that it gets. I mean, there are important things that happen every day. There are good things that happen every day that don't get the same attention. I mean, a, a good example might be that the reporting on crime has been intense in New York, in Chicago, in other places. But yeah. yet, when you look at the FBI reports on crime, New York is pretty low mm -hmm. um, per 100,000 people on the rate of murder, on the rate of robberies, on the rate of those things, mm -hmm. far lower than other places where their media does not report on it as regularly or as intensely. And those places get the reputation of being safe, while New York gets the reputation of being extraordinarily dangerous, which has political repercussions. Yes. I think that you can see the same thing as it pertains to the LGBTQ community. You know, we're hearing that drag queens in restaurants or in libraries reading to children are groomers and are dangerous and teachers that will bring their children to those kinds of things are, are dangerous in our schools and should be reported on. So that correlation between what the media covers and covers intently versus what it lets slide under the radar because it's not as important as it supposedly is, um, changes the way the public sees things. Yes. For instance, Trump gets a lot of, got a lot of publicity in the past because he made sensational claims and newspapers were then sort of reporting well, everything he said because they sold papers. So the profit motive of those newspapers made them pay attention to every word this guy was saying, even if it was false, because it helped sell newspapers because it was so crazy and sensational and verged on racist and verged on anti-immigration stuff. Um, so I do hold the media responsible. I think it's they've become perhaps more responsible, but there is that profit. Oh, if we if we report this uh, exciting story by this former TV star, then we'll get more readers and that will give us more, will be more successful in monetary terms. So that worries me that that profit motive makes them less responsible than they need to be in reporting. Also, the, the role of money in elections that's anti-democratic. That should be, there should be, uh, you know, the same amount of money and limited amount of money given to every party that's running candidates, and that should be it. Some, you know, billionaires should not, it's not democratic to have some people with more money, more power, be able to give huge amounts of money to uh, to politicians that they support rather than others. So there are certain blatant things like that going on that worry me very, very much as a Jewish guy, as a queer guy. Um, I see 
You know, I studied the rise of fascism in Eve Adams' time, and I see, I saw how quickly it could take over a, you know, a, a country like France. Um, and um, divide people and people turning in their neighbors and people becoming informers and terrible, terrible, horrible things happening. So I, I think of my work as on Eve Adams, for instance, as a, a warning signal to us to pay attention, to vote, of course, for uh, politicians that are that are progressive, that are for justice, for equality, you know, these are basic for to hold on to democracy, to develop democracy more, to get rid of the anti-democratic things in the U.S. So let's go um, change the subject a little. Um, a lot of the books or some of the books that you have that we now have were on sexology and the difference between heterosexual and where the words come from and homosexual. And where does that all fit in in LGBTQ history and the broader American history and the history in, in some sense of human beings? Yes. Well, as I wrote, after I wrote, two books on LGBTQ plus history. Um, that's what we call it now. It keeps expanding, which is great. Right, and 26 letters of the alphabet. We'll right. have them all at some point. Yeah. And lots of numbers. Um, after I did a couple of books on homosexual history, I said, well, you can't really understand homosexual history unless you understand heterosexual history. The two concepts are completely meshed together. So I happen to have the book I wrote called The Invention of Heterosexuality uh, here. And um, I really was um, one of the people that really began to study heterosexuality. Now there are other people doing it. And um, it really makes the point, this book, that you can't understand uh, people in the past unless you understand that these terms really came in in the, the first third of the the heterosexual and homosexual distinction came in to public consciousness in the early part of the 20th century. It's such a new, new way of categorizing people that they didn't have earlier. They, in their early American colonies, they had sodomy. Then later on, maybe they started naming some people after called sodomites. And then they had something called inversion, inver sexual inversion. Um, I love all these different terms. Um, and um, so uh, I think it's really important to study heterosexual history to understand the other part of the equation when you're studying LGBT history. So the same thing goes for, if you're studying African-American history, really are studying, you need to study white history as well and how, you know, depredations that, began under slavery are unfortunately in many ways continuing some, you know, and uh, in police actions against black people. And that, uh, uh, so I, I uh, pioneered in writing about heterosexuality. I had to explain why in the, in the beginning of the book, why I as a gay person was able would was able to write a book about heterosexual history. And I was afraid that um, it would be taken as a critique. And, uh, you know, some of my best friends are heterosexual. <laughs> I like to laugh and say that. Um, so uh, are your parents. 
Yeah, yeah, my dear father, um, my dear mother. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think to fully understand sexual history, we have to understand all of it, not just the, the put down peoples, but the ones who claim to be the normals. And even that distinction between normal and abnormal, when, you know, that sort of a medical distinction, um, when did that come in? Before that, people were called unnatural or natural. The good people were natural, the, the bad people were unnatural. So those distinctions have profound applica applications to the way or effects on the way people's lives are lived. You know, I grew up hearing about homosexuality as, oh, oh it's abnormal. Uh, I was reading, I, my parents were probably influenced by Freud. My mother certainly was. So, uh, you know, uh, homosexuality in, in some of Freud's writing is, is uh, you, you, your, your natural progress towards heterosexuality gets interrupted and that's not a good thing. And in some of Freud's writing and others, he's fairly positive about homosexuality and homosexuals. Um, yeah, so my, as I worked on history, this history, this sexual and gender history, I was learning. I am a self-taught historian. I don't have any degrees. I was a college dropout in the 1960s where lots of people were dropping out. Um, I did a lot of studying on my own of historical writing and ideas and how you write history. And I just, out of a love of doing this history, I developed my skill. And in you can sort of see the progress in my various books as they go along, where I become more confident in making interpretations, not just from presenting evidence like I did in the first book, Gay American History, but in the second book, Gay Lesbian Almanac, I am contrasting two different periods in LGBT history, in the early colonial period and in, in a period from, uh, I think it's, I haven't looked at it for a while, it's the 1890s to 1950 or something, to contrast very, very different periods to show people how different life must have been for those people having sex with members of the same sex or dressing differently than they were supposed to, or, you know, being called this or that. So uh, you can see uh, my becoming sure of my own voice as I do this history and I more and more write my own interpretive uh, and um, uh, more theoretical ideas about the meaning of this history as my books go along, my books on sexual and gender history. So based on your lifespan, um, you not only have seen the world go from G, gay, to gay and lesbian, to gay and lesbian, to lesbian, gay, uh, but you also, and, and also because of your family's interest in African-American history, you've seen the LGBTQ world, which was definitely racist at one time, and maybe still is to some degree, but not as much maybe, I hope, uh, to evolve as well. Uh, how was that? And is that is any of that reflected in the work that you've done? Since you did look at you, the, your first, one of the first books you did was finishing your father's book on, on Blacks. Um, and now uh, we are very tied together in terms of being part of this these minority groups that are constantly under attack uh, in, in today's world. So 
where do you see those correlations and what have you seen over the course of your work as a historian? Yeah, well, even I, who as a white guy and a young man was made aware of racism in a way that lots of people, white people were not, still I have had to learn um, I do. I will say that I did include lots of material about uh, African American queer people in gay American history. So there was there was a lot of, of material there. I, I was aware of the need to do that. But for instance, when I was working on the Eve Adams biography recently, I realized that Eve's world was so segregated between white and black that there was an absence of documents in her, the documents that document her life. There was an absence of reference to uh, black people. So I decided that I needed to comment in the book on the absence. Why aren't there more, why aren't there Black people mentioned in Eve's, in the documentation about Eve Adams' life. And it was because this society, even among these radical people, progressive people in the early 20th century, it was very, very segregated. Um, so I have a section in this book about Eve Adams where I talk about the absence. And I don't think I would have done that, uh, noticed that absence or being so uh, aware that I needed to talk about it without my, a present day consciousness about the need as, you know, uh, more uh, Broadway plays or including more Black actors and all kinds of roles. I was just reading about that in the New York Times. Um, so I too, you know, have a lot, we need to be you know, thinking about all of this all the time and trying to get conscious of what we need to do to fight racism and how it's sneaky it is and how it pops up in absences where it seems not to be there, but it is there. We do have a question um, from Ben saying, does your historical background inform your art practice in any way? And oh. what is your art process like? Yes, well, people may not know that I had an earlier career as a, I, first, I made a living as a textile designer and I went to music and art high school in New York City, a wonderful public high school that is now combined into LaGuardia High School in back of Lincoln Center in New York City. Um, and I was an art student, an art major at Music and Art High School. And um, I, I went back to doing art in around 2004, after not doing it for a long time. And I started going to drawing sessions at the Gay Center in New, at the LGB Center in New York City, where every Saturday there's a um, a naked male model. It's been going on for a long time. These drawing sessions, and it's a it's a celebration of homoeroticism to try to cap for me and for others to try to capture the sexiness of this model or the attempt to present himself as sexy. Um, sometimes my um, takes are sort of got a sense of humor to them, making fun of the uh, a, a desire of model to look sexy. So, um, and I try to um, present all of this work with great affection also towards my, the subjects that I'm drawing and painting. And I did have, I was lucky to have a, uh, an art show at the Leslie Lohman Museum 
it was called the Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art at the time. And uh, I think it was in 2013, uh, curated by a wonderful um, art historian named Jonathan David Katz. And we're not related. He was the curator of the show of my, I would, felt very lucky to have an art show. It's very hard to get an art show, uh, a one person art show of your work. And I'd love to have another one. I'm thinking about doing it again on my 85th birthday, um, perhaps at the gay center, at the LGBT center. So I'm, I'm old hat, I'm old hat. I'm calling it the gay center. It's the LGBT center. Um, I try to be up to date. Um, so I, 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 have done homo, this homoerotic subject matter. I've also done political art. Um, I did a piece called Warning Sign. It's it's uh, has a red bulb that flashes on and off, which I electrified myself. My mother showed me how to do that as a kid. <laughs> and um, it says, fascism warning. And this red bulb flashes on and off. And I like didactic art. And I've read a lot about Bertolt Brecht's ideas of uh, and his writing, his playwriting and his poetry writing. And he he wants to have a create a very social art that's concerned with things like the rise of fascism in his time. And he wrote plays that did that. And he aspired to a very high standard of creativity and achieved it in many cases. And his, a lot of his poetry is gorgeous and simple. Yeah, he, very, yeah. We have a, a, a question from Tony Phillips. Um, he says, I have two questions. Curious if Jonathan has seen Billy Eichner's portrayal of the gay historian in Bros. And if he has any notes, also, is the donation to Stonewall the result of any type of Swedish death cleanse type of decluttering of his own? Well, I I was really, to answer the second part, I was really glad that you people could accept 30 boxes of my books because I moved to a smaller uh, apartment and uh, I had to get rid of a lot of books that were dear to me about a lot about, some were about Walt Whitman, some were about Herman Melville, some were biographies, of famous queer people. And I was delighted that I could give uh, all these books that he needed to get rid of uh, to your archive and museum in Florida. Um, so, so what was this first part of the question? Did you see the Billy Eichner film Bros, where he plays the head of a new museum in a new gay museum in New York? And do you have any? And he was did some kind of work in history. Um, and did you find that he was worthy of getting notes? I didn't see it yet, but I'm very interested in seeing it. I've heard uh, that it's fun. It Sorry, is. I can't comment on it. I haven't seen it. If I was somebody else, I could con you. I could make <laughs> I don't need evidence. That is that is certainly true. That is certainly true. But now you now you have reason to go in and see it. Yes, I do want to see it. Is there another question? Um I'm not sure. Let me check. No, that's that one. But uh, what are the, will you write another book? Uh, books are so hard to write. Um, I've sworn I would never write another book, but I toy with writing a fuller me a memoir. I wrote and published a, uh, a short memoir when I had my art show 
in 2013, I think it was, or 14. Um, so it's about how I was encouraged to do art and did re quite remarkable art, I must say, as a very precocious little boy in Greenwich Village. So it's called Coming of Age in Greenwich Village, and you can buy it online. Um, but I'd like to write much more uh, and, you know, try to write my own history, place myself in my time. There were lots of things I heard about homosexuality as a kid growing up in the village. My father pointed out to me, he, when we were walking near Washington Square, a big park, um, my father said, those are homosexuals. There were these men sitting on the fence in front of, you could, the, you can't sit on the fence anymore. It's a different kind of fence. And these gay guys would sit on the fence and like carry on and um, say campy things to each other and to the people passing. And I guess I must have asked my father, what's a homosexual? And I guess he said men who love men or something like that. And we walked on. <laughs> so um, I would write a whole section about various things I heard about homosexuality in the 1950s, uh, 1940s maybe even, um, when I was 10 or, you know, 12 or whatever. So. Um, it would be, you know, I think it would be interesting to other people because it's, again, such a different time period. Um, things have, the gay movement has been really successful in a way I could never have imagined in the early 1970s. I went on demonstrations with the Gay Activist Alliance and I thought, why am I doing this? There's so few of us we're going to have, well, how can we possibly have any effect? And I think it's really important to know, to understand and appreciate the, uh, the gains that the gay people getting together in a movement to uh, go against prejudice against queer people has been, because so many just social justice movements don't have so much success. And it's good to know that you can be make changes for the better. There's a long way to go. There's a long way to go for queer people as well as every other put down group. So just taking that thought as, as time runs out, uh, who would you say are some of the two or three people, no more, um, whose shoulders we all stand on that have gotten us to this point? Well, Irma Shivad was one of them. She, I think of her fondly. She, there was a recent memorial to her wonderful send off. Um, and she, when she was head of the Arcus Foundation, she, I went to see her and she, I went, I went to ask for money to, uh, the first money to uh, create outhistory.org, the major website on LGBTQ plus history, US history in particular. And it was, it was the Arcus Foundation and Urvashi's head of it at the time that made Out History possible, the, the website that I was able to found with that kind of backing. So I am eternally grateful to Urvashi and for, for all the other uh, social justice activism that she um, accomplished in her lifetime. Um, uh, is there one so, other person? Uh, there are so many, you know, I, um, I have a friend, Channing Joseph, who's working on an amazing, uh, research project on black drag queens, um, who 
um, he's working on a book, and uh, black drag queens who or the head of which was born a slave. He's written about this a little bit on, you can find it on the internet in that he published an article in The Nation about this research and it's amazing material. And his work is a, will be a tremendous contribution. It's in progress. So, you know, it's, it's I will just wanna support that work of, of his, for instance. That is great. And that brings us to a close. So I want to thank you so much. Um, I learned a lot just from listening to you again. Um, it is a thrill for us to have the books that we do and to be able to both display them, protect them, and conserve them. Uh, anything you want to send is always welcome. And we will do our darndest to make sure that it has life for future generations to come. Uh, I would like to remind people to please become a member of Stonewall, consider joining us, come see the exhibit of Jonathan's books while they're up for another two months. Uh, it is really worth it just to see the, the depth of the collection. As he said, Melville, Whitman, and his own books, and so many others. And if you are around February 25th, we will be having our 50th anniversary gala here in Fort Lauderdale, celebrating 50 years of collecting books in our library. One of, if not the, as I said earlier, the largest lending library in the LGBTQ world with over 29,000 volumes on our shelves. Uh, come and share it, come and see our exhibits, come and talk, tell your stories, and we welcome your stuff as well because every story needs to be told. Thank you very much. This will be on YouTube in a couple of days. Please share it with your friends. It is important that we get the word out. Jonathan, thank you so very much and have a wonderful night. Thank you. <laughs>